what do you think Marx would say if he just looked at the different implementations of the ideas of Marxism throughout the 20th century, where his ideas that were implicit were made explicit? Um, would, uh, would he shake his head? Would he enjoy some of the parts of the implementations? Like, what do you, How do you think he would analyze it? Well, he had a great sense of humor. I don't know if you've had a chance to take a look at his writing, but he had an extraordinary sense of humor. So my guess is he would deploy his humor in answering this question, too. He would say some of them are inspiring, some of his interpretations of his work, and he's very pleased with those. Others are horrifying, and he wishes somehow he could erase the connection between those things and the lineage they claim from him, which he would... Uh, there's a German word. I don't know if these lang if you speak the other languages. No. There's a wonderful German word called Verzichte, and it's stronger than the word refuse. It's if if you want to refuse something, but with real strong emphasis. Verzichte darauf is a German way of saying I I don't want anything to do with that. And he would talk then, you know, in philosophical terms, because remember he was a student of philosophy. He wrote his doctoral thesis on ancient Greek philosophy and all the rest. He would wax philosophical and say, you know, that, that the ideas you put out are a little bit like having a child. You have a lot of influence, but the child is his own or her own person and will find his or her own way. And these ideas, once they're out there, go their own way. And as you said, there's a particular way that this idea spread, the speed at which it spread yeah. throughout the world made it even less able to be sort of stabilized right. and connected back to the origins of where the idea came from. The only people who ever really tried that were the Russians after the revolution because they occupied a position for a while, not very long, but they occupied a position for a while in which... I mean, it was exalted, right? There had been all these people criticizing capitalism for a long time, even the Marxists ever since mid-century. And these were the first guys who pulled it off. They made it. And so that there was a kind of presumption around the world. Their interpretation must be kind of the right one because, right. look, they, they did it. And so for a while, they could enunciate their interpretation and it came to be widely grasped as something which, by the way, gets called in the literature official Marxism. The very idea that you would put that adjective in front of Marxism or Soviet Marxism or Russian Marxism. There were these words that, who, where the adjective was meant to somehow say, kind of, this is the canon. You right. can depart from it, but this is the canon. Before the Russian Revolution, there was no such thing. And by the 1960s, it was already dispersed. It was gone. But for a short time, 30, 40 years, it was a kind of... And the irony is, particularly here in the United States, where the taboo against Marxism kicks in right after World War II, is so total in this country that I, for example, through most of my adult life, have had to spend a ridiculous amount of my time simply explaining to American audiences that the Marxism they take as canonical is that old Soviet Marxism, which wasn't the canon before 1917 and hasn't been since at least the 1960s, but they don't know. It's not that they're stupid and it's not that they're ignorant. It's that well, the ignorance may be, but I mean, it's not a mental problem. It, it's the taboo shut it down. And so all of the reopening that in a way recaptures what went before and develops it in new direction, they just don't know. Nevertheless, it's a serious attempt at making the implicit ideas explicit. The the, the Russians, the the Soviets at the beginning of the 20th century made a serious attempt at saying, okay, beyond the critique of capitalism, how do we actually build a system like right. this? And so in that sense, not at a high level, but at a detailed level, it's interesting to look at those particular 
uh, schools, maybe. Right, because for example, let me just take your point one step further. You really cannot understand the Cuban Revolution, the Chinese Revolution, uh, Vietnamese, and, and the others, because each of them is a kind of response, let's call it, to the way the Soviets did it. Yeah. Are you going to do it that way? Well, yes and no is the answer. This we will do that way, but that we're not going to do. And the differences are huge, but you could find a thread, I can do that for you if you want, in which all of them are in a way reacting. <laughs> they to are, the originals. Yes, <laughs> very much so. Well, like m maybe most of rock music is reacting to the Beatles and the Stones. There's something like that. <laughs> 